One, for those of you that also work financial IT, or heck, any IT within highly regulated industries, you have probably dealt with the dreaded compliance. In my position, I am expected to hold people to it, while also being able to flex it enough to help them out of a situation and to be in actual compliance. You know, wink and nod it away to keep them out of trouble because of an honest mistake that I can easily correct. Usually no big issues unless folks get pushy or blatantly flout compliance rules and regulations and we have to crack down and turn them in for it. What I get is recently, my boss hands me a ticket and asks me to fix it. In my position, I am the buck stops here desk. I fix it or it can't be done for regulatory compliance or we just refuse to support esoteric software and hardware nobody has heard of. I read through the ticket notes, bungled by level one and two, of course, from the halfway point of the prior several days of notes and interactions, the user makes it very clear how important compliance is to them, and that we have to fix this issue now to keep the financial advisor they work for in compliance or heads will roll. Why would heads roll? Because they have no access to a certain number of years of client and financial data they are supposed to have access to. Fair enough. I've helped many others in that situation, time to get them out of a pickle. I then read it a second time to see what the actual issue is. Can't trust the users to tell the actual truth and can't trust level one and two techs to have accurate notes or actually do their jobs. Mr. Financial Advisor is mad because major brand A cloud storage isn't working and all of his client information for several years is in there. The fun part is major brand A has been blocked by both internal software security policy, access is blocked, and is listed out explicitly by name in the software policy as banned for the past several years, and it is not considered secure. So Mr. Financial Advisor has been bypassing security for years. Big red flag. Normally not an issue, again, I'm allowed to flex rules to help folks like Mr. Financial Advisor out of situations like that and help them get into compliance. All I had to do was get the software to install, it had been failing to install, and yes, I have my methods, and help them get their client data moved to one of the three approved storage and backup solutions offered by the company. Then Financial Advisor's assistant, Mrs. Screechy, got involved she was being obstructionist, she was nasty, and treating agents below me like dirt. Then came the magical words from her, in an email response to the ticket. This has to be in compliance now, no exceptions. I need a phone call now to resolve this issue. I demand absolute compliance. I grinned. I grinned savagely. I've dealt with her type many times, and already knew what was going to happen. So I had an internal giggle as the following happened. Mrs. Screechy had left a cell phone number to call, not an issue. However, I knew my number showed up as potential spam on most carriers, but showed up as financial company tech support on the company phone line. She refused to answer my call, obviously, because it is potential spam. I left a voicemail and went to update the ticket. Before I could finish updating it, she responded on the ticket very rudely, and telling me to make everything compliant now, or she was taking it to the compliance officer as a breach of contract and compliance. Up to this point, I was willing to work with Mrs. Screechy and her boss, Mr. Financial Advisor, to get their butts out of the fire. She insisted on getting on her hands and knees and rolling on the hot coals. I copied the relevant parts of the security and software policy into the ticket notes, explaining in third detail how the software they had been using for years was named explicitly as not compliant and labeled as insecure cloud storage and insecure remote desktop access. I then also copied out the relevant part of the policy explaining what was allowed. Three options that comply. I also made sure to commiserate in my closing notes to Mrs. Screechy and Mr. Financial Advisor that while I truly sympathize with them and appreciate that they want to remain within compliance, because of the prior listed rules in the security policy, we would be unable to assist further, as I did not want to breach security policy in my attempts to assist them, as installing said software 
was a breach of policy. Ticket resolved and referred to their compliance officer with all relevant communications about how they had all their sensitive client data in this insecure cloud storage that had been bypassing security for years to access it. Come yesterday, I get to grin when Missy Screechy and Mr. Financial Advisor leave a review on the ticket for how the Level 1 and 2 agents and how Level 3, me, did. Grumpy doesn't begin to cover it, as they had also taken the issue to executive escalations. Needless to say, I grinned and had a great laugh as the head of escalations is my co-worker in the cubicle next to me. Co-worker asked me about it. I gave all the details. They laughed, and resolved out as non-compliance on part of advisor. All because of a little attitude and unwillingness to work with me to get them out of that very situation. I don't mind bending the rules to help folks get out of a sticky situation. I've done it many times before, and I'll do it again. Just be nice, and I'll bend over backwards to help you out because I enjoy helping others. But this is one where I got to enjoy being able to say... The buck stops here. Two. I fixed it. Gerald dumped his bag on the desk and sat heavily in his chair. His expression, somehow simultaneously smug yet annoyed, portrayed the disdain he held for Carl. Gerald, the company's head of IT, was Carl's boss and, according to legend, the fountain of all IT wisdom. A highly accomplished and experienced veteran in the dark arts of computer sciences, Basically, the computing equivalent to a Japanese ninja master. Carl had his doubts. So it tested okay then? Carl inquired. Perhaps it was a bit of a cheeky question, but Carl didn't ask without good reason. Gerald's reply dripped with confidence. Didn't need to test it. Testing is for losers. He was now tapping away at his computer, seemingly too busy to talk. It took a few seconds for the gravity of the statement to overcome Carl's mild surprise. What do you mean, you didn't need to test it? I know it's fixed. Carl took a couple more seconds, and how do you know that? Because I fixed it. Gerald fixed a disapproving glare at Carl for a couple of seconds before returning his gaze to his monitor. Despite the statement making no logical sense, it actually answered Carl's original question. So, that's a no then, he thought to himself. While he didn't really want to continue to grill his boss, he needed one vital piece of information. So what did you do, exactly? Upgraded the bios, came the curt reply. Now, Carl was really surprised. He tried a different tact. You do know what the original problem was, right? Didn't need to, the typing continued. After a few seconds, Carl realized his jaw was hanging open and his brain had frozen. Utterly failing in his attempt to process the abject dearth of intelligent reasoning which had just been ungracefully dumped on him. He really couldn't think of anything which adequately summed up his thoughts at this point, but managed to utter a token reply. Well, Carl paused, still gathering his wits. I guess we'll wait and see how it goes. Don't need to wait. Gerald stood and walked briskly from his desk, calling back over his shoulder, it's fixed. Carl watched Gerald leave the room, no doubt off to some very important meeting elsewhere in the building. His brain was now physically hurting, screaming at him to seek out intelligent life somewhere, anywhere. Maybe someone on the internet? Perhaps he could find a random stranger on the street. Could the potted plant in the corner be of some assistance? He just needed some semblance of cohesive thought to quell the pain of a logic that was currently raging genocidal warfare on millions of his brain cells. Carl studied the potted plant critically. He imagined that at this point, it had a pretty decent chance of giving Gerald a real run for his money. Right, Carl thought to himself, summing up his conversation with Gerald. You don't know what the original issue was? Applied some arbitrary fix, which, let's be brutally honest here, has only a slightly higher probability of working than a barbecue in an arctic snowstorm. Furthermore, you didn't test it, and you don't intend to monitor the situation to confirm that your fix worked. Carl paused to consider the facts. 
Seems like a winning formula to me. Now, Carl wasn't just your average IT engineer. He had been in the industry for over two decades and had seen a lot of frontline action. He had worked his way up the ranks to his current senior IT team leader position by pure hard grind. Troubleshooting was Carl's bread and butter, and he was often called upon to resolve issues that the rest of the team were unable to make any headway on. In short, he knew what he was doing. The particular problem in question had already been escalated to Carl some time earlier by the engineering team, and Carl himself had spent dozens of hours systematically trying to determine the cause of the issue. After running through all apparent possibilities twice and still finding no solution, Carl knew that it was time for another set of eyes. Either he had missed something, or had made a misdiagnosis at some point in the process. A few days ago, as Gerald was away at the time, Carl had gone to Tony, Gerald's boss, to discuss the situation. Tony was the owner of the company, an ex-rugby old boy and lager aficionado. He didn't have any technical expertise, but what he lacked on this front, he made up for in his ability to consume alcohol. Why don't you get Gerald to take a look? Tony blathered, beer in hand. It was only 2pm, but Tony liked to start the evening early. Carl barely managed to suppress a painful wince. I'm not sure Gerald is the right person for this job. Besides, he has a heap of other things on right now. Nah, he'll be fine. Tony took another swig of his brew. He can spare a few minutes out of his day. Carl grimaced. Unfortunately, this is not something that's going to be resolved in a short time frame. The team have spent an age on this, and I've also spent a considerable amount of time trying to determine the source of the issue. Tony opened another beer and stifled a belch. Gerald's pretty tech-savvy. I think you might be surprised by how fast he works. Don't worry. I'll speak to him tonight about it. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks. Carl walked away, regretting his decision to escalate the issue. But what else could he do? You never know, Carl thought to himself. Maybe Gerald will find something that I've missed. What's the worst that can happen? Of course, now Carl was starting to see the beginnings of the worst, although little did he understand the full extent of how full-blown, mentally deficient, nipple-twistingly exasperating things were about to get. A few days later, Tony called Carl into his office. Carl knew things were serious when Tony put down his beer as he entered. Carl? Tony looked serious. I have some concerns about your troubleshooting abilities. Carl was mildly shocked. Why is that? This razor issue you've been working on for some time. Tony looked Carl in the eye. Gerald just told me he fixed it in under two hours and the client has confirmed that everything is now fine. For the briefest of moments, Carl experienced a flash of self-doubt, but he then remembered that it was Gerald they were talking about and his confidence instantly returned. However, there was always a possibility, however infinitesimally small, that Gerald had somehow managed to actually resolve the issue. Carl frowned. Hmm. Let me check that out and get back to you. Tony assented and went back to his beer as Carl returned to his desk. For the next two hours, Carl systematically combed the affected systems, gathering evidence of the original issue and its current status. After he had finished... Carl knew what had really happened, and had the indisputable evidence to prove it. Reviewing the results of his research, Carl kicked himself for doubting his own work for even a second. Of course Gerald hadn't fixed it, because as an engineer, Gerald was about as useful as a can opener to a school of sardines. While Gerald had indeed performed the BIOS update that he said he had, as Carl had suspected, it had absolutely nothing to do with the original issue and subsequently had zero efficacy in resolving it. What the logs clearly showed that in three days immediately after Gerald's fix, there was no change to the issue. But following that, there was a noticeable drop in occurrence. Curious as to the reason for the issue's recent drop in frequency, Carl investigated further. What he discovered earned him some odd looks from the other engineers, as he involuntarily roared with laughter. There was one more loose end to tidy up. 
Carl called the affected client to inquire as to their view of the status of the issue. The client wasn't happy. No, the problem's still there. Maybe it happens slightly less now, but it's still really ripping my underpants. Also, since that Gerald guy was here, our goddamn nightly report isn't running anymore. I got management all over my ass about this, and a TPS report backlog longer than a Microsoft Minute. When the hell are you guys going to fix this thing? Carl apologized on behalf of the company and assured the client that they were doing everything they could to resolve the issue as fast as possible. Then he began compiling his report to Tony. The report outlined the fact that Gerald, who had not actually known what the problem was, had not bothered to check with the client as to whether his fix had been effective. And most unexpectedly of all, had not in fact resolved the issue. However, the part of the report that Carl most enjoyed writing was the one which outlined that after having realized that his fix had not resolved the client's issue, Gerald had attempted to cover up his failure by setting the servers to automatically reboot every night. Not only had this failed to eliminate the issue and had not resolved its root cause, it had caused the client to experience other new issues. After receiving and reading the report, Tony responded to Carl with a simple, Thank you. Carl felt he was entitled to some kind of apology from either Tony or Gerald or both, but never heard anything further on the matter. Subsequent to all this, Carl went back to looking into the problem. He eventually discovered that while his troubleshooting methodology and logic had been without fault, the issue was due to an undocumented bug in Microsoft Office, which spanned two different versions. While Carl had swapped out the original version of Office for a newer one, it was only by changing to a third version that the issue was finally resolved. As far as Carl could tell, he was the first person to globally narrow down the cause of the issue. Not long after all this happened, Carl was let go because management wanted to hire more staff in a different area of the business. Carl now works as a freelance IT consultant, troubleshooting major issues for clients and giving strategic advice and is earning two and a half times what his old company were paying him. Sometimes Carl wonders how Gerald is doing with his latest troubleshooting efforts. However, he doesn't wonder long, because he already knows. 3. So today I went into our local cheap buy store. Everything in this store is always 50% off. So I want to buy something using my card. I often have to do the mental math, buying stuff priced up to $20, so that it covers the $10 cost required for card payment. Keep this in mind for later. Another thing to keep in mind is recent concerns for the environment mean that many shops no longer supply a plastic bag to put your purchases in. This cheap buy store is one of them. And to compensate, the shopkeeper has put a sign up behind the counter saying, No plastic bags! And for those who don't speak English, it includes pictures of plastic bags with a big red line going through it. On this same sign, underneath all this, it suggests you bring your own bag with you. The seller also has a variety of bags on display in front of the counter that a buyer can purchase. Most options are material, others are canvas, and others are like permanent plastic or, well, like a raincoat material. The tablet can be folded up into tiny wallet-sized pouches. I on with the story. As I was entering the store, someone had approached the counter. I didn't take much notice as I wanted to buy a coin purse. So headed straight for that aisle, which happens to be the one nearest the counter, which is how I heard all this. The woman handing her purchase at the counter must have wanted to pay by card. That's eight dollars. The woman must have handed her a card because, sorry, you need to purchase ten dollars to use the card. How much is this? Dollar fifty. Well, can I buy these too? Pay by card and you can give me 50 cents changed? No, sorry. The buyer leaves the counter and looks around the store as to what to buy to make it to $10. I know this as she has to squeeze past me into an aisle I was in. The store is tiny and so are the aisles. Any person obese, like yours truly, basically takes up the entire width of an aisle. Yes, it's one of those stores. A few minutes later I hear the conversation continue. I was still searching coin purses, undecided as too many options. The buyer must have paid then. Can I have a bag? I'm sorry, no bags, but here are some here, pointing to bags on display in the front counter. This discussion had my full attention now, so I started watching this interaction. 
The buyer is holding her purchases, roughly a half dozen items. Well, how am I supposed to carry all this? Once again, the store clerk points to the bags on display. These are only one dollar. Why don't you have any bags? She points to a sign on the wall behind her, because no one has plastic bags anymore. You should tell me to bring my own bags. You're stealing from people. I told you last time you were in here. Now I'm wondering if this is part two of an ongoing bag quarrel. You're ripping people off, making people pay for bags. That's stealing. The clerk still points to the display. They're only one dollar. By now, I try to intervene to de-escalate. I approach the counter and offer to put the bag in my tab so she can have a bag for free. No, I can pay. And then turns to the clerk. But this is wrong. You are a thief. So I disappear into the aisle I was in, in basically the same way Homer Simpson backs into the bushes in that comic meme. You are very rude, says the buyer. No, you are very rude. The sign is right there. The bags are there. No one else complains. Everyone else knows no more plastic bags. No, you are very rude, and you're a thief, and I will not come here again. No, you're a very rude person. I'm not a thief. The bags are only a dollar. You're a thief and very rude. I will not come back. Okay, bye. And the buyer storms out the door. It wasn't until after she left, leaving some other stunned buyers, including myself, that an irritated clerk then realized that, oh... I wonder if that was an entitled person. I felt an overwhelming need to apologize to the clerk for this crazy person, and she just looked at me bemusingly and replied, You'd be amazed at people that come in here. It's no wonder that poor woman always looks so stressed. 4. So this just happened. To give you a little backstory, I'm a 19-year-old female who works full-time hours at a part-time job. I've been working hard these past few days without much break, and just got off a 10-hour shift before this happened. One of my better days. After work, I came up to the local Whataburger to wait on my boyfriend to get off work. No makeup, dirty old work clothes, messy shaved head, short yet stocky build. I walked past this table of girls who were maybe 16 at most. They were the pretty popular types. New on-brand clothes, nails, well-done hair, full makeup, and super skinny. Walking by, I smiled and thought, "Oh, how cute. They remind me of my little sister. I never paid them mind up to the events of this story. Now, when I come to Whataburger, my boyfriend gets me a bowl of fries with bacon and cheese on them, so I won't be hungry as I wait. As I sat down and ate, I heard them talk. I didn't care or mind because it was none of my business what these girls talked about. I'm a grown woman and they're just some kids having fun. That was until I overheard some of the things they were saying. Now, I can't determine everything they said, but I'll tell you the bits I caught. Did, did you see her? Yeah, she looks awful. Why does she look like that? She looks so weird. Her clothes are dirty. She's fugly. Now, I don't want to assume they were talking about me. For all I knew, they could have been some girl on Instagram or TikTok. Unfortunately, however, my morbid curiosity took over and I gave them a glance to see two girls staring at me like I was an animal at the zoo. Suddenly, they started laughing, and simultaneously I heard the girls say, Oh my god, she heard you! Oh my god, she heard me! Then following laughter, I decided to hide my face and look down. I wanted nothing to do with this. I worked so hard to get out of high school, and even harder to escape bullies in middle school. I wanted to hide and disappear from the embarrassment, and surprised that people were this indecent to others. After a moment, they left in a hurry, and looked up from behind my hand and just stared. My first thought was, wow. Least to say, I was incredibly embarrassed. I don't believe people should treat each other that way, but one thing I know is middle school girls are some of the meanest people on the planet. Please, if you do see someone like me in public, be nice, or better yet, Ignore them. Don't be like those girls in this story. If you're like me and you're struggling, it's okay. Beauty comes in how you treat others. Be your best self. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. 5. I was in a local Burger King today, waiting to give my order. The employee was very detailed and thorough in taking people's orders, and made sure that everyone got exactly what they had ordered. This meant things went a little slower than they usually would. 
My son is on the autism spectrum, and I recognize this behavior, so I believe the cashier may have been also. He also made sure he repeated everything back to the person who ordered, so he knew he got it correct. I was about to step closer to order when Karen came flying over and cut in front of me, waving her wrapped whopper. Excuse me, I need to know if there's any salt on my whopper. I ordered it with no pickles and no salt, and I see that little picture of pickles is crossed out, but I don't see any picture of salt that's crossed out. I need to know if you added salt to my whopper. The employee says, Ma'am, I made sure I pushed the no seasonings button on the register when you ordered. I also turned around and told them special order, no seasonings on your burger. And then I asked them when they handed it to me just to make sure, and it's on the receipt. It says no seasonings. She then starts yelling at the poor employee. But I need to know it doesn't have salt. See, the pickle thing is crossed out, but I don't really like salt, so I need to know there's no salt in it. He explains again what care he took to make sure there was no salt on Karen's burger. But then the manager wandered over. The manager says, Ma'am, he made sure they made your burger with the utmost care. I can assure you there is no added salt. There may be a small amount already in the mayo and the bread, but there's none in the tomatoes, onions, or lettuce, and he already said there are no pickles on your burger. Karen goes up an entire octave. I didn't know it was possible. I need to see the picture that's crossed out on the rubber. I need to know it's never annoying. Finally, the manager takes the wrapped whopper from her, pulls the black marker out of his pocket, and proceeds to draw a little salt shaker on the wrapper. Then he points to it, crosses it out, and says, See, no salt and hands it back to her. Well, I couldn't help but bust out laughing so loud. Karen grabs the whopper out of his hands, turns around and gives me her best Karen look and storms off to eat her salt-free, no-pickles whopper. I ordered and told them both that they were my heroes and enjoyed my whopper with cheese. The cheese was circled on my whopper. They are very thorough. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Idiots in the Wild, episode 124. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button for me, thank you. And let's see, uh, I kind of threw myself off my rhythm there. Oh yes, if you'd like to get the videos a little bit early, you can support me for as little or as much as you like through my Patreon, which is linked in the description, and it's also on the screen. It's Hellfreezer. And you can also make donations during this video and other videos if you wish to do on a one-off basis. And uh, there's also a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise shop in the description, uh, which is the official Hellfreezer store except no knockoffs. I'm joking, who's going to knock it off? Well, actually, one of my moderators did create knockoff Hellfreezer merch once, but, yeah, you know, there were no phone cases available, so I let it slide. <laughs> they did offer to pay for it, and I was like, no, of course not. You should have asked. I'd have given you, I'd have given you the artwork for it if you'd wanted it. Uh, anyway, um, let's see. Do, do, do. Yep, there's some of that. And uh, while none of that is necessary, it is appreciated. And before we go on, we have a little birthday shout-out to do today. And today's shout-out comes from Enza, and it goes to their partner, Genviev. I hope you're having a lovely birthday today. Make sure that Enza is treating you and spoiling you, as I'm sure you did not so long ago when it was their birthday. And if you happen to be busy, as sometimes it does suck, but we do have to work on our birthdays. We shouldn't have to. I think that should be a law, but well, sometimes we do. Then I certainly hope the next available day off that you both have a wonderful time. And before I go, I'd like to sing Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Genevieve. Happy Birthday to you. Alrighty, let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is is there any food stuff that you'd never buy or use but if it was given to you you'd eat it like i'm not a fan of tomato ketchup 
but I don't hate it. I currently have a bottle in my refrigerator because Jack likes it, uh, and I'm kind of u- just using it randomly. It's just like, okay, that exists. I'll put it on there for a bit of extra flavor. Um, pineapple on pizza. I've never ordered it. I think I bought one when it was reduced, like really cheap, like 50 pence for a whole pizza, so I'm not turning that down. But again, if someone offered me a pizza, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll eat that. I have no objection to it. Let me know what you think. Let me know some of your ideas in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to make creaky noises with my chair. I should probably figure it out. I've oiled that. I don't know what to do. with it. Anyway, uh, with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourself.